Welcome to the Retirement Learning Lab, where we teach you how to retire without running out of money. Thank you for joining us today. This is the NASDAQ Stock Analysis. Thank you for joining us today. It's been kind of a crazy day in the stock market. There were a lot of things down. If we look at actually what's been happening here, let me give you a quick rundown if you haven't kept up with it from uh, the market standpoint. We saw the Dow Jones Industrials was down about 1.92%. The S&P was down about 2.37%. And the NASDAQ was off over 3%. So it was an ugly day on the stock market. It's really interesting because it started up. And then all of a sudden, it just went backwards from that standpoint. And there's a lot of things weighing on the market right now. It's really, really hard to keep focused on what you should be doing for the long term when there's so much noise going on in the stock market. And we're going to look at a couple of different stocks today that regretfully, there's a lot of noise that goes on with these different stocks. But what you have to do to be able to make a long-term profit is you have to be able to just shut that crap out. You just have to be able to just put it out there and just say, I'm not going to listen to it. I'm going to pay attention to the long-term focus. And today I'm going to explain to you why some of these different stocks gyrate so much and why you hear about them so frequently in the news from that standpoint. So let's get started right into it today. Let me bring up on the screen the first couple of companies that we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about Netflix and Maxim Integrated uh, products. And it's really interesting. You hear a lot about Netflix and everybody knows, well, I'd say everybody, a lot of people know about Netflix. So how many of you out there actually started with Netflix when you got the DVD in the mail? I didn't even know really that they continued to do that, but they do have that service continued. But they've actually separated it from the regular online subscription, the streaming service in itself. But, you know, one of the biggest reasons why that we hear so much about Netflix is because it's one of the, the four original FANG stocks. Remember Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, and Google. Those four FANG stocks, in themselves really push the market forward from that standpoint. But, you know, even though that this stock was all 4%, look at what it's done over the past year. A year ago, it started at 268.35. Today, yeah, it was all 4% for a day, but it ended up at 473.25. And over a period of a year, if you held on to this for a year, you had 76.36%. So what if you'd lost 4% today? Okay, so the, you started out the day at 80% up today, and you ended up at 76%. So, okay, so what? All right. Now, when we look at these different stocks, we look at three really principal things. The first thing that we're going to look at is going to be earnings. We will look at the competitiveness and the stability of the company. When we look at the earnings of Netflix, you got to go back and look over the past quarters and see how they've actually done 
And hey, I want to thank you all for, for joining today. If you've got a comment or a question, make sure that you enter it into the platform that you're on. Uh, even if you're listening to this on the playback, let me make this just a little bit bigger for you and kind of explain to you what you're looking at. Uh, you're looking at the actual earnings report for this particular company for Netflix since actually 2014. So we've gone back quite a bit from that standpoint. Um, every single quarter, they've really met the expectations that were out there. The solid line is going to be actually what they paid, and you're going to see that the dotted line is going to be what was estimated. Now, coming right up now, you're going to see that there's some questionable things going on, and that may be affecting the current value quite a bit of this stock. But they're looking at the estimated earnings as being higher than actually what the actual earnings are. And that's going to be the first time for a long time. They've been propelled so far, so fast. And this is one of those stocks that actually benefited from the coronavirus pandemic. Um, everybody's staying at home. You're watching Netflix or you're watching YouTube or you're watching uh, Amazon Prime. And those are all competitors. We're going to talk about that in just a moment. But the company in itself has mainly kept up pretty well with uh, expectations of earnings. It doesn't pay a dividend, so we're not going to stick on that. But let's look at how it compares with some of its competition. You would probably compete with Amazon, but you got to understand, too, that Amazon is 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 even though that you have Amazon Prime that they compete with, Amazon has a much more diversified business uh, than Netflix does. Netflix is really just focusing on the streaming service and the DVD service. Um, plus also, you know, they get into the idea of creating productions right now. And that's something that's really big. They had been hurt by the production of uh, Cuties. You saw that that was out there. And I think there was such an uproar about that, that it did affect the company. And that will probably affect the type of product that they put out going forward. Because you, the consumer, if you speak loud enough, they'll listen. When we compare it to other companies that are like that, probably Viacom, CBS, and Comcast are going to be closest. Remember, uh, Comcast is NBC Universal. So um, they're, they own each other from that standpoint. But it's interesting to see of the NASDAQ 100, this is the top 100 stocks of the, the, the NASDAQ. You're going to see... Follow this line, the green one, the dancing cursor. This is the only five-star stock in the entire index. But that's because it's so far undervalued. I don't know if that's a good thing or not. I'd have to look at it a little bit deeper before I said to you, hey, you need to buy this stock. But remember, you can't take what's happened in the past as a guarantee of what's going to happen in the future. We do want to look at what the competitive note competitiveness of these companies are. And that's when we get into the aspect of a company's moat. If you've listened to me before, if you haven't, welcome. I'm glad that you joined me today. Um, we talk about the moat of a company. Let me explain very basically what a moat is of a company, if I can find it here. Remember that a moat is that imaginary barrier that a company digs in between itself and its competition. And when we look at the moat for Netflix, Netflix only has a narrow moat. That means that they do have a lot of competition out there. You know, right now we have HBO, we have Peacock, which has come out from Comcast, we have Disney Plus. So there's a lot of competition that's out there. But I think that when you look at the footprint that Netflix has, it's going to be a really hard competitor because there's a lot of stickiness with people when they get ingrained in a particular product. When you look at the number of subscribers in a year, it's gone from 152 million worldwide to 193 million. Now, that, that brings with it what's called the network effect. That means that more people that are involved in it, the more people that become involved in it. It's just 
it's something that's conversation. You know, you get together and you're talking about this with coworkers or people that you know from church or wherever you that you you uh, speak with people. You don't congregate quite as much now because of the pandemic, but a lot of people talk about Netflix. Uh, and what did you watch on Netflix tonight? And it's really interesting when we look at the company in itself. Uh, the company has created a tracking algorithm, which actually takes a look at that 193 subscribers on a worldwide basis. And that's one of the proprietary benefits of the company. They have a really good idea of what people are consuming because of their algorithm and they're able to track. And that helps them in their production going forward and bringing more people in. Now, there was a survey that was done in 2018 that was called the Sandvine Global Internet Phenomena Report. And what it showed, this is, this is amazing. 26% of the global streaming that occurs comes from Netflix. Now, when you think that there are other new services which are coming out on board, like, okay, we'll have Disney Plus, we'll have Peacock, we'll have HBO Max. Those are all going to be newcomers. Yeah, they do have a customer base and they're going to pull customers in. But... Netflix is already pulling in 26% of the global streaming that occurs. YouTube only has 21%. Amazon only has 6%. You would have thought really that Amazon had a lot more, but it doesn't. So the network effect, the global effect of Netflix is going to be really hard to, to uh, replace. And every person, well, let's say the average user, those 193 people that are out there, they're spending an average of an hour and a half a day watching Netflix. That's huge. Now, when we look at actually what the current value is and what the fair market value is, Morningstar is the company that I turn to for this information. And Morningstar is telling us that the fair market value of this is $200. It's going to have to drop a lot to get to that. That means that right now it's 135% overpriced, according to Morningstar. Now, that's not something that I'm agreeing with, but it's according to Morningstar from that standpoint. Um, that gives them only a one star. You got to understand that the star system for mutual funds and ETFs is different than the star system for, um, for stocks. The star system for stocks is really based on the value of the company and what they look at. And they just don't pull something out of the air. What they're looking at is they're looking at the earnings per share that's filed with the 10K. That's actually the report that's filed with the Security and Exchange Commission. And they follow that, they being Morningstar, they follow that very closely when they're calculating what their estimate is going to be for uh, the fair market value. It's based on a derivative of the earnings per share. Sometimes it's a little different. Okay. Another thing to look at is really Netflix is, it's in the news that Netflix's goal is to go from that 153 subscribers to the 193 subscribers to the 200 million subscribers in 2024 or by 2024. So hopefully it gets there. Now, when we look at what other analysts are saying about Netflix, this is really interesting because there's actually a few analysts out there that are saying that it's time to jump ship and bail. I'm not sure that I 100% agree with that. Now, see, look, let me explain to you something. First off, I want to give you what the average analyst is. And I want to break this down just a little bit about why you might see that there are a couple of analysts or four analysts out there that are saying that this is going to be a company that you should sell. When we look at what the average analyst says, they say this. They say this. The average analyst is going to say that this is a moderate buy. It's brought down because of the few analysts that says that it, it it's it's a strong sell. But let me explain to you just a little bit about what goes on with Netflix. You hear a lot about this stock in the news. Primarily, yes, but it's one of the FANG stocks that's out there and it's pushed on by other technology stocks. But 
you have to understand that there are a lot of people out there that are trading this stock that are not trading it for the long term. They're trading it for a short term profit. You're going to have day traders which are trying to make a profit from this very quickly. Now remember to be a day trader, a real day trader, you're going to have to have a $25,000 minimum. You're going to have to meet certain qualifications to do that. Yes, that's true. That's the way the regulations work. Some people say that they do day trading, but really they do what's called swing trading. And swing trading is people try to get a longer term, maybe a week's worth of movement in a stock, but they get it in a fairly short period of time. Um, you don't have to declare yourself as a day trader per se, if you do swing trading. And as a result, you don't have to have that minimum capital requirement that's out there. But when you hear a lot that's going on about the news of this stock is up today, this stock is down today, you hear that a lot about Netflix. That noise is coming more from those who are actively trading this stock. There are some day traders that that stock is basically their career. They're trying to make profits off of that particular stock and to game it so that they can make a profit off of it over the, the short period of time and add up the string of profits from that standpoint. That always doesn't work. Um, actually, there's a study out there that tells that day trading, basically out of three day traders, two of them are losing and one of them is making a profit. Um, I have to bring that study back up sometime. All right, let's move on and talk a little bit more about the next stock that we're going to talk about. Oh, just a reminder, this is not a buy sell recommendation. I'm just reporting to you information. All right, the next company is another one that's been in the news for a couple of different reasons, Maxim Integrated Products. So what Maxim does is they create analog and mixed signal integrated circuits. And they're a company that uh, it's in the news actually, because they're going to be merging soon with analog devices. Um, I say soon, it's been put on the back burner and I'll talk about that in just a moment. But they, they're, they're very popular for power management, audio conversion sensors. And they're in a lot of different industries, the computing industry, industrial, automotive, and automotive, automotive and other consumer related products to enunciate today. Okay, one of the reasons why I brought up the capitalization of this in particular is because this company is going to merge with analog devices and analog devices is not a small company by far in itself. Uh, Maxima Integrated Products is a $17.6 billion company. So it's really a pretty large company. But we also have to look at actually what's been happening in the news real recently with this stuff. Okay, so all of a sudden it came out in the news and you probably, if you if you don't follow it, it was in a couple of different publications that was in Forbes, the Wall Street Journal, Investors Business Daily, a lot of different things like that that you might not cover as much as I do, but they're going to merge with analog devices in a $20 billion deal. Now, one of the things that you hear about going on right now between analog devices and maximum integrated products is that there's a lot of litigation that's going on. And there are a number of um, shareholders of large size substance, let's say, that don't feel that the agreed to upon price between Maxim and analog devices is a fair price. So they're suing to try to get that change from that standpoint. Now, the Federal Trade Commission has to make their approval on this particular uh, situation. So actually what happened, and this happened, it, it's like in July, we saw the news that they were going to merge. And then all of a sudden, the next month, it says, nope, we're not going to merge anymore. It's not that they're not going to merge. What happened was that ADI pulled the filing from merging so that they could give the Federal Trade Commission time to review everything. It's still on. And actually what happened is the clock was reset to usually, you know, it takes about 30 days or so for the review of this. They, they pulled it and they reset the clock starting again. I believe, yeah, it was actually around August 24th. But the two companies together, 
when we'll look at them compared in just a minute, but the stock itself over the past year has been pretty stagnant. It's done okay. Um, it started a year ago at 55.63. Today it ended at uh, 64.60, um, up about 16%. And you know, it's really a shame that as we talk about stocks today, we look at a 16% rate of return and go, eh, not that much. But let me tell you what double digit rates of return of any type in a period of a year are good. If you can sustain even high single digit rates of return for a long period of time with your retirement accounts, you're going to be able to save a substantial amount of money. But let me tell you this. Hey, thanks for joining. Let me know where you're from. If you're joining out there, put in the comments and say, hey, I'm from wherever. We have actually a couple of listeners that listen to us in India and Italy. So I hope that you'll chime in there in just a minute. But the point is going to be that when we look at analog devices, we have to also look at integrated products in itself. There's no dividend, but I look, I put this up here for another reason. ADI does have a dividend. They have a good dividend of 2.16%. ADI has $41.6 billion in assets. And when we look at what's going on with Maxim, Maxim deal, the Maxim deal is $20 billion. So when we put that $41 billion together with the $20 billion, I can guarantee you, well, I can't really guarantee anything. I would be willing to bet you that that dividend is going to change. They will probably continue to have a dividend, but it, don't buy this particular stock if you think that it's going to pay a 2.1% dividend. That is ADI, because it's going to change when that merger occurs. Let's look at the earnings history that's going on with this particular stock, too. Let me make it just a little bit bigger for you so that you can see what's going on from this standpoint, if I can hit the right button. All right, remember that the solid line is going to be the actual earnings and the dotted line is going to be the estimated earnings. So we go all the way back to 2014 and you can see that most of the time, this company is really well run. There was a period of time in 2019 where they were going underneath the estimated, uh, div estimated earnings a little bit but not that much. And then they pulled back out. Interestingly enough, look at this. When the pandemic hit, this company actually excelled. That's that's highly unusual for a, a, a semiconductor company. So they've actually done pretty good. I think that part of the momentum that's gone on with Maxim is the merger mania that's going on with ADI, but that happens sometimes when companies get together. Okay, let's look at his competition and actually pull together the, the last year's rate of return with ADI. Now, Maxim is in blue and ADI is going to be in red. So let's go over here to recently. You're going to see that there was a surge that was pretty much after the merger announcement, and then ADI actually dropped a little bit, and that's pretty common to happen. And they both kind of stagnated. We've seen both of them drop off recently just basically because the market's overheated and it's selling off from that standpoint. There's a lot of things happening in the economy. Hello, I think you've heard that there's a pandemic going on. Plus also, the Federal Reserve just can't make up its mind. It's like they put out in the news about what they are going to do. And then when Chairman Powell starts to talk, the, the, um, the markets, let's say the people who are market makers, the brokers, whatever the case is going to be, they get a little nervous and then they start to sell just because they think that he doesn't have confidence in the way that he speaks. Ah, geez. Cut the guy a break a little bit, why don't you? Okay, Microchip Technology is another company that we want to compare to, and they've done pretty well. Now, why do we do this? Why do we look at all these companies together? This is the reason why that we do this, and, and I want to talk to you just for a second about this. Remember that when we're looking at a stock, we're looking at three different things. We're looking at the earnings, number one. We're looking at the stability of the company, and then we get to the the competitiveness of that company. If the company can't compete, then you don't want to own it. But the idea is that Maximum Integrated Products is a very competitive company in the uh, analog device arena. And analog devices are a little bit different than 
uh, other different types of products. Hold on. Let me get back out here. And I want to talk to you a little bit about that because we're going to talk about it. Oh, remember, past performance is not a guarantee of the future results. So we get over and we talk about the moat. Now, if you just joined us, remember, this is what a moat is. Remember that that moat is that imaginary barrier that exists in between a company and its competition. It's what keeps the competition at bay. And when we look at analog devices, the intangible assets themselves are a big, big deal. Um, the, they have proprietary technology that goes into developing and manufacturing those particular chips. And they also have a high level of manufacturing expertise. So that's one of the biggest reasons why this company has a wide moat is because they have something that really can't be competed with and can't be replaced. So it makes a big deal from that standpoint. Now, Let's look at what Morningstar is saying about the actual value of this particular stock. Now, if you followed me before, and I hope you follow me more, hey, if you want to hear about the information on NASDAQ stocks on a daily basis, where you want to learn when I put new information about investing or retirement planning out there, hit the subscribe button if you're on YouTube. And then you'll get notified. Also, if you're on Facebook on that platform, just like it and you'll get notified. You'll, it'll, it'll show up in your stream. And if you're on Twitter, do the same thing. Leave a comment. Let me know where you're listening from. Even if you're listening on the replay, I love hearing from people from other countries. Um, it's interesting to get your take on what you see as is going on with some of the companies here in the United States. Okay. So moving on just a little bit, the fair market value of Maxim Integrated Products by Morningstar is actually $65. And what that means is <laughs> it's a real thin discount. It's less than 1%. So basically you're trading right now and it, it'll change tomorrow morning, obviously, because you know, you're talking about a 40 cent uh, discount. That'll go away really quick um, or get more depending on what's going to be happening in the stock market. And that actually gives this, this stock a three star rating. Remember the star system is just a, it's the way that we peg the, uh, it's the way that Morningstar pegs the valuation. It's not the same thing as their ratings on their mutual funds. Just keep that in mind. Now, when we look at what the other analysts have said about this particular stock, um, my little circle didn't move over quite as much as it should be, but there were 12 analysts that were polled in this particular report and they didn't, they weren't as really um, keen about everything that was going on. Now I know this actually says Micron technology. That was a mistake on my part. I apologize. This should say Maxim integrated products. That's correct. I didn't correct this from yesterday. Okay. But, when we look at what the average analyst is saying about this, not quite as good as Netflix. They're saying this. So the average, uh, and not, it's not Micron. I'm not Micron. That's a mistake. I agree. This should be maximum integrated products. The average analyst right now is saying that this is a hold. And I really think that one of the biggest biggest reasons why this is a hold right now is because of it's been pulled from uh, the merger announcement, and also it could be weighed down because of the litigation that's going on, because of the people that feel that they didn't get the fair shake in the merger, and of course we've got other things going on in the economy too that weigh on this quite as much too. So. But remember, even though that I've told you that it's a hold, don't go out and sell it if you own it based on this. Do the research for yourself. And it's really, in, it's really important that you do your own research or you go out and you, you contact a guy like me and you say, hey, can you help me with my retirement account? Can you help me and look at these particular stocks or these particular mutual funds or this particular uh, retirement account? I'm getting ready to retire or I want to retire at this particular date. Um, 
you need to think of it on your basis, not just on what I say in this snippet during the day. When I do the NASDAQ stock analysis, I'm looking at individual stocks today and what they're doing and then give you some idea of what the, the earnings are, the stability and the competitiveness. Then you have to look at it and say, okay, that might be a good stock that would fit in my overall portfolio. I had a guy that contacted me last week and he said, I bought DocuSign and um, he bought it when the earnings announcement came out right before it started to fall. He paid quite a bit for it. Um, he was off quite a bit and he'd only put about $15,000 in that particular stock. And he was asking me if I thought that I, that he should sell it. And my, my first question was, is how old are you? And when he said, I'm 23 years old, and I asked him, I said, why are you buying this stock? And he said, well, I want to hold it for 10 years. I want to, I want to build some wealth up. And I, I told him, I said, look, you don't want to treat this as a day trade. If you have faith that this company is going to be a good long-term stock based on its earnings, its stability, and its competitiveness, then hold on to it. If you don't feel that it's a competitive stock based on its earnings, its stability, and its competitiveness, then sell it. Um, or the other side of the coin is, too, you need the money for something else. And if that's the case, that happens sometimes. But try to take the long-term approach. So to, to get to the point I want to get at right now uh, as we move on, if you want some help with your retirement account or with your stocks, Go on over to my website at richardsfinancialplanning.com. Click on the schedule a call to learn more button. And then you and I can get a chance to talk just a little bit about your portfolio. I don't charge anything for new people that want to come in one time and talk to me. And when I say come in, we do everything virtually. So either we'll do a Zoom call or we'll just do a plain old uh, telephone call or cell phone call. But with all that, I wanted to tell you thank you very much for joining me. Make sure that if you're listening to this on YouTube that you hit the subscribe button. Uh, leave your comments. If you're listening on Facebook, Twitter, or Periscope, do the same thing. And we'll talk to you tomorrow. Have a great day.